in a urchin at because of the times said, don't wear beards because it looks like homosexuality or drug dealers. I don't care what Mr. Urshan said. I only care what Yahweh said in the Torah. I only care what his Hebrew prophet said. Shalom, shalom, guys. I had a video sent to me the other day by a friend of mine who is a pastor in the broad Pentecostal sense of the word, I guess you'd say. And the title of the video was, Did Jesus Have Long Hair and a Beard? So he sent it to me and I thought about listening to it or watching it. I listen to so many different videos when I'm working and all that kind of stuff. And sometimes I have a chance to watch videos. But mostly I listened to him, but I decided, I told him, I said, you know, I, I'm not going to listen to this one. I'm going to do a blind reaction. I've never done this before. Okay. So I, I'm playing this video. I've never seen it. I don't know what it's going to say. I don't know what it's, <laughs> it's going to be like, but I assume, I assume coming from him because he told me he'd like to see me uh, go through it and, and maybe pick it apart a little bit constructive criticism, right? <laughs> I'll say something to that in a second. I assume though, that it's going to be something against having a beard. And as you can see, obviously I'm not against having a beard. And, uh, so I, it'll be interesting to see this. I do want to say beforehand because it needs to be said, and we don't want to be overly critical that I was raised in the Pentecostal church uh, one of the most influential men in my life when I was a teenager was my youth pastor. And I'm pretty sure to this day, he still attends a UPCI assembly. So they do a lot of good for the community. And I've met a lot of good Pentecostal people over the years. I am familiar with some of the more old timey Pentecostal views, one of which disallowed men to be on a platform if they had facial hair. And I don't know if that's still a thing in the UPC denomination. I'm just not involved in it anymore. Uh, but I do know that from time to time, I will hear people of a Pentecostal slant. I'm not saying that they're UPC denominationally, but they're of a Pentecostal or apostolic slant. And they'll teach against uh, a man having facial hair. I do want to give kudos to uh, my old Pentecostal youth pastor. He ever listens to this or watches this. Um, I love him dearly, him and his wife and his family um, and uh, to the Pentecostal church as a whole for my good Christian upbringing. I was very thankful, still thankful today to be raised by conservative, fundamental Christian parents. Very strict. I was never went to public school. They always sent me to Christian school. And we were in church every Sunday morning, every Sunday evening, and every Wednesday night, and then extra time on revivals. <laughs> so I lived a church life growing up. I do not regret that, by the way. I do not regret it. I'm very thankful for that. I like to think that I've continued to progress in my understanding of Holy Scripture, and uh, that's what's gotten me to where I'm at today. So let's go with this screen so you can see my reaction. Now, I, <laughs> I may... <laughs> I may um, have some eye rolls or chuckles, and uh, I'm not trying to be rude or mean if I do that, but I can't help it, right? All right, so I study the Bible for a living, I tell people sometimes. I work for a living, too, but when I'm not working, I'm either spending time with my wife, children, or studying the scriptures, so that's legit. I do do gardening in the spring and summer, so I, I, that's another hobby that I have as well, but, um, but yeah, I study the Bible constantly. I have I don't know, probably five to 700 books in my library from different denominational slants. So if I hear something that I know goes directly against what the scriptures teach, um, then it might make me chuckle or it might make me roll my eyes. So I, I slightly apologize for that beforehand, but uh, that's what makes this fun, right? The blind reaction. Quality. 
I like good video quality. I wish that was more tech savvy. Didn't pay attention enough in school, I guess. We didn't teach us any more stuff when I went to school. The Jam, the Christian Life Broadcast. All right. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to praise Christian Lord, Life brother. Broadcast. If it's your first time tuning in, we're so glad you were able to join us. If you've been here before, welcome back. It's such a privilege and an honor to minister through this uh, broadcast. Christian Life Broadcast is a ministry of Christian Life Center right here in beautiful Palm Coast, Florida, 5200 Beltaire Parkway. And uh, we are a Pentecostal church, an apostolic Pentecostal church. There you go. That loves the Lord and we love the Spirit of God. We had such a wonderful Wednesday night service last night. Uh, boy, since our uh, beginning of the year consecration, our, our flow has been so different. It feels like before that, we were trying to push to build a flow. And now we're having to hold back that flow so we can get into the Word of God together. And that's always every, uh, it's, it's every pastor's dream to be able to do that. And I'm so thankful for the people of God. Today, <clears throat> I want to talk about a subject that the Lord has really piqued my interest about and uh, sent me on a journey in this past year in particular. And um, I, I want to relay this to you. And it may be the first time you've ever heard this or you may have heard this before. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, want to, I want to answer a question, if I can, if the Lord will help me today, that seems to be a, uh, a hot topic. And so I, I'm not sure what you're going to do with this, but let's just dive in together and, and see where we go. But I want to answer the question, did Jesus hmm. have a beard hmm. and long hair? Hmm. Did Jesus have a beard and long hair? I can answer it for him right away. <laughs> but we're going to see what he says, right? I don't want this to be preaching by me, but... um. I have witnessed to many people uh, about my beard, not because I forthright with it or just bring it up, but because when you have a big beard like this, a lot of times you get a comment from somebody. I remember one time I was standing in line at the theater and a guy just about faced as we were waiting to buy some popcorn or something, I think. And uh, he said, how long did it take you to grow that beard out? Now at the time it was, Oh, I don't know. There was probably four or five more inches to it. And I, when I started having grandchildren, my first grandson was born in, I want to say 2018 or 2019. I can't remember. It was 18 or 19. He'll be, I think he'll be six this year in, in July. So it must, it must've been 18. And when, when I started uh, having grandbabies, when my oldest daughter was pregnant and expecting my first grandson, I have seven now, by the way, seven grandchildren. So you always bless me. I told my wife, I said, I'm just going to let it grow. And so I just let it grow for, I don't know, almost two years without doing any type of trimming or anything. And so it, it got real, real long. And then I decided to trim it up and I, I found a pretty good length that I like it at right now, but I thought about growing it out a little bit further. But, um, anyhow, the dude just said, how long did it take you to grow that beard? <laughs> and so you kind of use it as a springboard or, or a witnessing tool. And so you can talk about the beard in scripture and then you can kind of bring up scripture and, and fill out where the person at, is at religiously or, or spiritually. Um, so this is a topic he says been tugging on his, his heart, I guess. And uh, let's see what he says. Interesting. This is going to be, this is going to be good. And um, spit it out. I um I I'm just tingling with excitement about this. I, bet you I really are, am. I'm just being honest with you. I need to get because there's so much information on this. It's it's incredible. Once you start digging in, it's like you could just dig in forever. I, I'm a history major. I love history. I went to the University of Florida. <clears throat> I began with psychology, and I was um I did very well my first couple of years. Uh, grade wise and and I uh, just felt pretty good about myself and I got involved in psychology and absolutely hated it couldn't stand it uh, there's just so much stuff I just I had zero interest in and uh, so I switched to history and realized that history is studying psychology in reverse 
you study why people did the things they do and and uh, you had to do a lot of research find original sources and cite your material and it's just been a it's been a a, a wonderful help to me in digging out subjects and of course i'm i'm i am uh, i'm not a certified expert but i uh, i sure had fun and i hope you will too as we go along this journey so did jesus have long hair and a beard first of all did jesus have long hair now we're tagging into uh, the one of our previous broadcasts of um, does Corinthians 11 mean long hair or uncut hair? And so speaking to men in particular, it would have been a weird thing for the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 to say it's a shame for a man to have long hair. Hmm. It's unnatural for a man to have long hair if he would have saw a long-haired Jesus. Now, Paul says he saw the Lord. He was an apostle born out of due time. He actually yeah. physically saw the, the physical man, Christ Jesus. He saw him. And so if he had long hair, long, beautiful, curly hair down to his shoulders, that he could, you know, while he was preaching, um, it would have been weird for Paul to, to say that. But yet he said it. And so there's several things to consider here. Number one, um, that Jesus had a Nazarite vow. All right, for a second here. Now it's interesting, and this is the this is the hang up a lot of times when I talk with my Christian friends is that notice he begins his video. He begins his entire video by going to First Corinthians chapter eleven. Now he then goes over to did Jesus have a Nazarite vow? Okay, that's Numbers chapter six. But he begins in 1 Corinthians 11, and he says it would have been strange for Paul to say it's a shame for a man to have long hair if he would have looked at Jesus or saw Jesus, which I agreed that he did see Yeshua, if Yeshua would have had long hair. Now, 1 Corinthians 11 is not where to begin. Where you begin is the book of beginnings, Bereshit, Genesis, as we know it from the Greek, the Septuagint uh, version of the first book of the Bible. Genesis is a Greek word. The Hebrew would be Bereshit. 1 Corinthians 11 is not where you begin your study here. All right. So Yeshua, Jesus, came before Paul, an apostle of Yeshua, right? Shaul, Shaliach. But Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy is the Torah. This is the books of the Torah or the book or the scroll of the law. So is there anywhere in the Torah that forbids a man to have long hair. <laughs> See, in Acts chapter 17, I think it's verses 10 through 11, the apostle Paul, he preached to some people at the city of Berea. They were called Bereans. And Luke, the author of the book of Acts, says that they were more noble than those at Thessalonica because they examined the scriptures daily. And they tested what Paul preached to them to see if it lined up with the scriptures. Now, remember when Luke wrote the book of Acts, he was writing about a time period at, but about a time period where no New Testament, as we popularly call it, existed. So when the Bereans were searching the scriptures, it meant they were searching what we call the Old Testament or the Tanakh. Okay, the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim, the law, prophets, and the writings. So they would listen to Paul preach. They were eager. They examined the word with readiness or eagerness of mind. And then they looked at the Tanakh, the Holy Scriptures. They didn't call them the Old Testament, but the Holy Scriptures to see if what Paul was saying was so. Now, that didn't necessarily mean that Paul preached to the Bereans about this subject that we're talking about, hair and beard. But any subject that Paul would have preached to them, they would have looked and see if they found it in the scriptures. Is there anywhere in the Torah, in the law or the prophets, the law or the prophets that Yeshua said he did not come to destroy? He said that twice in Matthew 5, 17. Is there anything that says a man can't have long hair? First Corinthians 11 does teach, uh, at least at the time period that Paul was writing, that there probably was a difference between men and women's hair lengths. And so women would generally have longer hair than men, but that did not mean that men never had 
locks of hair or long hair. Now, you see, I'm, which I've got my toboggan on, right? Because I haven't combed my hair today. <laughs> but I've got, you know, what we call payout right here from Leviticus 19, 27, which are the side locks. They're turning gray. I'm getting gray as the grandbabies are, are being born. <laughs> and my hair will cover my ears, mostly my ears. And in some Pentecostal churches that I grew up in, that'd be a no-no. I mean, you'd have, you'd have to cut before I could play the bass guitar or something on the platform. Um, so some people would consider this to be long, but yet my wife, whether you were looking at me and my wife from the front or the back, you could distinguish us. Uh, you could see from the front that I had a beard and she was smooth faced, right? Like a woman. And if we turned around to the back, I have longer hair. I don't have a crew cut. I have a lot longer hair than this guy that's, that's speaking here, but my wife has longer hair than me. Right? So let's pull up. Let's see if we can do this here. Let's remove this. If you look at Ezekiel 8, uh, beginning at verse 1, and it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, the fifth day of the month, as I sat in mine house, I'm reading KJV, and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of Adonai, Yahweh, fell there upon me. And he beholds a likeness as the appearance. All right, look at verse 3. And he put forth the form of a hand, and took me by a lock of mine head. This is the prophet Ezekiel. So the prophet is the man that stands in the place of Elohim upon the earth. But look at this word lock. If you look at this word lock, tzitzi. This is the same word mentioned in the book of Bamidvar, the, the book of Numbers, chapter 15, 37 through 41, about make fringes on the four corners of your garment that you cover yourself with. So this is the tassels. This was a lock. This was a festoon. This was something like a braid that, that formed a lock at the end. Ezekiel didn't have a crew cut, right? That would that would be like what we would call later a, a Greco-Roman haircut. Ezekiel had long enough hair that you could actually pull uh, a lock of. All right. So Hebrew men generally wore their hair longer because of Leviticus chapter 19 and verse... 27 where it says ye shall not round the corners of your heads neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard assuming that you have hair on the top of the head which it grows naturally and for a, a man at least when he comes of age he begins to grow hair on his face so this text assumes that the hebrew men had hair on their head and hair on their face and they were not permitted to round the corners of your head. That word corners there, I believe, is yeah, paya. Plural would be payot. And then it's the same thing for the, the beard, corners of your beard. Let's look. I think I've got a comparison here, Leviticus 19.27. Let's, let's do a parallel. There we go. So, Brenton's, this is the Septuagint. You shall not make a round cutting of your hair on your head, nor disfigure your beard. Good News Bible, do not cut the hair on the sides of your head or trim your beard. It's interesting. Uh, literal standard version. You do not round the corner of your head, nor destroy the corner of your beard. New English translation. You must not round off the corners of your hair on your head or ruin the corners of your beard. Now, my understanding of the Leviticus 19, 27 text is that the sides of your hair and going around like this. All right. If you look up some of the ancient Egyptian, Babylonian, and then later Greco-Roman haircuts, they would often shave the sides right here and then leave a tuft of hair around here and then shave on top to resemble the rays of the sun. And Hebrew men did not do that. They let the locks of their hair grow longer where they would have peyote or locks or zitzit, Ezekiel 8, 3, on their head. And it's the same thing with a beard. My understanding of Leviticus 19.27b has to do with you're not allowed to shave the borders or the sides of your beard. The word uh, uh, payot or payot can refer to sides or the outline that forms the image. So I don't do any shaping on my beard. And obviously I don't take the sides off and just have a goatee, right? I believe that will be forbidden in Leviticus 19.27. So... What we've done here is we went back to the Older Testament. The scriptures were being a Berean here. We are showing that based on the beginning of the Bible um, and then from the prophet Ezekiel as well as, as an approved example, 
that the men of Israel, of which Yeshua was, he was a Judahite, he was Jewish, right from the house of Judah, the tribe of Judah. The men of Israel generally would have longer hair than the surrounding nations of the, the male members of the surrounding nations. And they would probably have beards that were long enough to grab a hold of and pull. And so to start in first Corinthians 11 and say, well, it would be weird for Paul to say it was a shame for a man to have long hair. If Jesus had long hair, it's not the place to start. And furthermore, we could probably pull up 1 Corinthians 11. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 15. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. Yeah, for her hair is given her for a covering. Verse 16 is, the, no, 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 no. Verse 14, that's right. Let's see. It's been a minute since I've read 1 Corinthians 11. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. Let's look at the parallel here. Why? Nature itself teaches you that long hair on a man is, is a disgrace. Literal standard version does not even nature itself teach you that if a man indeed has long hair, it is a dishonor to him. Does not nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, is it, it is a disgrace for him. There is one Bible that I read at a time, have long hair. Let's see from the Greek to have long hair, to wear the hair long. I cannot remember which translation it was to wear tresses of hair, but obviously here, verse 14 about men is contrasted with verse 15 about women, right? Women have the long hair, men do not have the long hair. And it can be read in the sense of if a man wears his hair like a woman, is it is a disgrace to him. And in that case, it would align itself with the Torah. So we'd, we're being a good Berean. We're taking the Acts 17, 10 through 11 approach and recognizing that Paul here is co comparing and contrasting men and women. He's not saying that Hebrew men did not have longer hair, but what he's saying is they did not wear their hair like a woman. They were not trying to look feminine or they weren't wearing their hair as long as the Hebrew women did. All right, let's pull... Our Pentecostal brother back up. We'll see what he says next. Is, is there any way I'm actually going to get through this? We'll see. This talks about this in the book of Numbers, a Nazarite vow. Um, but I'll tell you, there's several, several powerful points that are brought out in the New Testament that can show us emphatically that Jesus did not have a Nazarite vow. Uh, one of the, okay, now it, it I don't want to go get ahead of myself, but it sounds like he's saying something contrary to a Nazarite vow. Now you can go to numbers chapter six. Once this is all off the top of my head. All right. So I may could go in depth more on this at another time, but if you turn over to numbers chapter six, the vow of the Nazir means a vow of consecration. It's a vow of holiness. OK, and it could be taken by a man or a woman and you could not trim the locks of your hair. My understanding of this is the hair that grows from the head, not the hair that grows from the beard. I don't think that a Nazarite vow forbade a man to groom or trim his beard, but it did forbid a man to groom or trim his hair. Now, I could be wrong on that. It could be both. I've never taken a Nazarite vow, so I've never studied it as in depth as I would if I decided to partake at least in part for a Nazarite vow, but a man or a woman were not allowed to trim their hair. So if during the time period of the Pentateuch, one Israeli man saw another Israeli man that had long hair, like say past his shoulders or halfway down his back. And he noticed the man didn't drink wine or strong drink and didn't eat grapes and that he didn't trim his hair. Would he think the man that he saw with that long hair was consecrated or a heathen? Well, in the context of Torah, Israel, you would think, oh, the man's decided to take a consecrated vow, a vow of the Nazir. Now, a vow of Nazir could be taken for life or it could be taken for a period of time. 
we see this in number six, and we probably see this as well in Acts chapter 21, um, the vow of the Nazir. At the end of the vow, uh, the head was shaved, both male and female. So it couldn't be a transgression, a sin. First John 3, 4, sin is transgression of the law for a woman to shave her hair at all costs. Uh, we see this in Deuteronomy too with a captive female. Um, but the, the vow of the Nazir is, is, is a consecrated vow. So at the end, the, the hair is shaved. At the beginning, the hair is let grown. Uh, this also proves that it was not a commandment for a woman of Israel to not trim or cut her hair at all. Uh, it proves that because it wouldn't make any sense for the law to say, if you're on a Nazarite vow, if you go on a Nazarite vow, then you, then you can't trim your hair. Right. So women in Israel probably did have longer hair than men, but they were not forbidden by the Torah from trimming their hair at all or grooming their hair at all. And uh, a man, obviously, based on the Nazarite vow, wasn't forbidden to let his hair grow out. He was considered consecrated. So my guess is he's going to probably say all oh, that's, you know, that's the old Bible. I remember a preacher when I was growing up, he'd say back in the old Bible, <laughs> like it was outdated and primitive and we couldn't use it anymore. Um, he's probably going to stick with the New Testament, but let's go. He says Jesus was not a Nazarite. I, I don't know if he was or not. I don't know if he was on a Nazarite vow or not uh, um, uh, for a portion of his life. I, I, I don't know. Um, I don't have anything against him not being on a Nazarite vow. Um, but let's see what this uh, Pentecostal brother, our Pentecostal brother says. Components of consecration of that Nazarite vow in the Old Testament was that a razor was not allowed to touch their hair all the duration of that vowel, the length of that vowel. And, and so um, that could have been the case. Maybe Jesus just had a Nazarite vow and he didn't cut his hair. But the, there's other stipulations to that Nazarite vow. Mm -hmm. Number one is you're not allowed to get around any kind of wine at all. And it would be pretty weird for the first miracle of Jesus Christ known to scripture and to history to be converting water into wine if he was a Nazarite. Mm. Um, so he would be... Okay, no. Uh, the Nazarite vow says nothing about you're not allowed to get around any kind of wine. You're not allowed to drink wine or strong drink. You can be in the same room as wine. <laughs> you could be at a wedding feast. You could turn water into wine. And it sounds like he's actually thinking that Yeshua's miracle in, recorded in John 2 was turning water into wine. I hope he doesn't think he turned water into grape juice. I can do that with a Kool-Aid packet. So, uh, But it sounds to me like that's what he's thinking. But that wouldn't prove that Yeshua was not on a Nazarite vow at the time. I think we could show that he did not take a Nazarite vow for life. We know that he had wine during his last supper with his disciples, which some say was either the Pesach meal or a mock Pesach uh, of, of sorts. So we know that he had it there, but that doesn't preclude him from having taken a vow of the Nazir previously in his life. Heeding one aspect of the Nazarite vow, but completely disregarding another. Um, he had he had wine quite a bit. And of course, wine can mean one of three things. Mm -hmm. Here we go. <laughs> uh, the, the, the word wine is translated from uh, glucose or oinos in the New Testament. So it can mean absolutely uh, sugar wine, which is inebriating wine, fermented wine. It can also mean grape juice. Mm the fruit of the vine, the squeezed grape. And that's referred to in the Old Testament and new as wine, just the normal good old fashioned grape juice. And so he not only turned another water into wine, he drank time. wine. He, he drank grape juice. He drank the fruit of the vine with his disciples. Uh, during that last supper, he's sharing this with them. And so it would be weird for Jesus to have a Nazarite vow with only one aspect of that vow in place you would be creating an entirely new version of that. Okay, no problem. Good point. So if Yeshua can be shown to have drank wine or grape juice because both were forbidden on the vow of the Nazir, then he obviously was not on the vow of Nazir at that particular time. It's, I got no point against that. That's uh, that's that's a valid point. Um, 
So, yeah, and then there's other instances where he touched dead bodies. Now, of course, you can say he touched dead bodies, but he raised them to life. But still, he's, he's uh, you, the, the Nazarite. Yeah, I see your point. Vow yeah. stipulation said you're not allowed to sure. come near or touch a dead body. Of course, Jesus did that multiple times. And so um, I think there's pretty good evidence that Jesus did not have a Nazarite vow. Yeah. And coupling that with Paul's writings, in 1 Corinthians 11, saying it's a shame for a man. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, natural line, if it goes beyond the natural line, it begins to flow oh, like the hair oh, of women. Oh. And that's a shame. No, 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 no. So no, I, no, 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 no. Oh, my goodness. Natural line. Okay. Um, somebody say eisegesis. <laughs> There's nothing in 1 Corinthians 11 about there being a natural line. He's contrasting male to female. Yes, female Christians, Jewish, Gentile, likely had longer hair than male Christians, Jew and Gentile. That does not mean that men did not have locks of hair or longer hair than the Greco-Roman male population or the bald, clean-shaven head Egyptians, etc., all right. So there's the, the contrast, again, is, is male to female. It's, it's a shame for a man to wear his hair long like a woman. That's what Paul is talking about in First Corinthians 11. So natural line that sounded like some uh, old timey Pentecostal standard stuff right there that this not in the Bible. You know, it just it, they just make it up. I doubt I doubt that very seriously. I'm like 101 percent doubting that. And um, so so where do we get this? Image you you have, um, in every um movie that's produced about Jesus, he's got long hair and a beard. In every picture we ever see of Jesus, he's got long hair and a beard. Ah, uh, the ah. actors have long hair and beards. What wh where does this come from? All right, so now he's throwing in the beard here. But for a second, let's talk about uh the chosen. Uh, I actually love the series. It doesn't mean I agree with everything on it. Um, people want to crucify me on Facebook when I talk about how I enjoyed an episode of The Chosen. <laughs> so there are some theological points or Christological points that they have brought out that I don't agree with, but I think it's fantastic filmmaking. I love their portrayal of Yeshua as an actual human being um, who laughed and cried and had feelings and hurt and uh, and was a, just a, a down-to-earth guy. Um, I think it's a great portrayal of the outward appearance of what Yeshua may have uh, looked like in regards to having the beard and also having the longer, not long like a woman. You know, if you notice the uh, woman on there, Mary Magdalene's got the longer hair, but he has the, like this, this neck length or shoulder length hair, as do some of the other uh, disciples. This would have been a common way for the Israeli or the Jewish man to look in the first century. It's taken, he says, where do we get it from? It's taken from Leviticus 19, 27. That's where it's taken from. Now, granted, some of the depictions in art and also on the movies have this long flowing golden locks, you know, of Yeshua. And yeah, that's, you know, probably come from a later European bent. Let's see what he says next. Well, first of all, I want to tell you that beards in particular uh -huh. were a normal thing in the Old Testament. Um, you can look at, at, at Leviticus chapter 19, verse 27 yes. with me. Yes, yes, yes. God gave a commandment, you shall not round the corners of your heads, neither yes. shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. Yes. So, yes. Uh, and then he said, you shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord, shall not drink or eat anything with the blood, neither shall you use enchantment. What's he talking about? All this stuff was Egyptian culture. Ironically, the culture that God brought Israel out of. So the Egyptians, the, the goatee is the classic Egyptian beard that came from Egypt. Mm -hmm. Egyptians made that famous mm -hmm. and the Greeks made the kind of the, the scruffy look famous. They mm -hmm. didn't have big, long beards. They had the scruffy kind of just facial hair everywhere. Look famous. The Egyptians made the goatee famous. And so God is saying you came out of Egypt. Do not 
do not look like the Egyptians with your beard. So it was a given. He didn't command them to have a beard. Mm. He didn't say you can't be clean shaven or you must have a beard. And he didn't say you can't have a beard. It was just a given. If you have a beard, don't cut it. It's going to be. Okay. All men that are adult male have a beard. One brother told me one time, he said, well, if I had a beard, then I wouldn't mar it. And I told him, I said, brother, I said, every time you shave, you're marring it. I asked him if he shaved. He said, yeah. I said, what do you think you're shaving? You're shaving the hair off of your face. So Leviticus 19, 27, the Orthodox interpretation of Leviticus 19, 27 <laughs> is that a man of Israel, a man of age is not to shave his beard off. And I think by approved example or necessary inferences in the rest of scripture that the beards of the men of Israel were long enough to be to be pulled. It wasn't like a five o'clock shadow or stubble. It was long enough to be pulled. I don't see anything in the Torah forbidding trimming or grooming of the beard. I don't. I I can't find anything of that. I I wrote a book on this subject a long time ago, and uh, maybe I'll I'll put a link in the in the comment section here or in the uh, little note section of this video. But in my Humble opinion, Leviticus 19.27 is assuming that the men of Israel had beards and they were not allowed to uh, disfigure, meaning mar. Uh, mar means like to corrupt, decay, to rot, to remove, to do away with. And so if I trim or groom my beard, like if I was just to groom my beard and take an inch off like that, I would still have a beard. If somebody saw me, they'd say, oh, it's the guy right there. It's the one with the full beard. But if I shaved off like half of my beard, shaved it off, then I would have marred that portion. Or if I shaped the borders of my beard, whether underneath or right here, then I would have marred the border. Uh, that's a border. I would have marred the border of my beard. Okay. So uh, to me, Leviticus 19.27 is a direct command for an Israelite man. that He's not supposed to shave his beard and the beard grows uh, you may say, well, my beard doesn't grow that good. Uh, hey, Yahweh made you how he wanted your beard to be. Let it grow out. Don't mar it once you come of age. And, you know, Yahweh will be pleased even when we keep the least of his commandments. Matthew 5, verse 19. Gnarly, nasty food stuck in there somewhere. It's going to be a long, scraggly beard. Do not have a beard like the Egyptians, the culture you came out of. So there was a definite commandment there. I don't know why he's talking about gnarly About men with beards. So men had beards in the Old Testament. <laughs> and, and, and truthfully, there's nothing in Scripture that goes overtly, conspicuously, directly against a man having a beard. Nothing. There's no commandment Zero. that says thou shalt not have a beard if you're a man. Yeah. There's nothing like that. And there's no Zero. commandment that says you must have a beard. It's just not there. There's a commandment in Leviticus 19.27 saying not to shave your beard. Okay, so that, that, that command is there. And then Leviticus 21 with the priests as well. The priests weren't allowed to shave as well. But the, Leviticus 19 is, to, is a common man of Israel. But his other point, there's no commandment saying that you cannot have a beard. That's true. It's assumed all through the Bible. Let's pull one up. Let's look at this text right here. Second Samuel chapter 10. Reading from the New English Translation. Later the king of the Ammonites died and his son Hanan succeeded him. David said, I will express my loyalty to Hanan son of Nahash, just as his father was loyal to me. So David sent his servants with a message expressing sympathy over his father's death. When David's servants entered the land of the Ammonites, the Ammonite officials said to their lord, Hanan, do you really think David is trying to honor your father by sending these messengers to express his sympathy? No, David has sent his servants to, to you to get information about the city and to spy on it so they can overthrow it. So they are actually coming out of sympathy, but the Ammonite officials say, no, they're spies. Verse 4, so Hanan seized David's servants and shaved off half of each one's beard and he cut the lower parts of their robes off so that their buttocks were exposed and then sent them away. Now, any of us would be embarrassed. Well, 
some people are some people go to these nude beaches and they don't believe in modesty whatsoever which is ridiculous and they, even some christians would wear something that's next to being nude right but there's a lot of people a lot of christians that would be embarrassed if they had their garment which men of israel wore by the way tunics or robes uh, we still say we got to go get dressed nobody says we're going to go get pants it's because all men and women both wore dresses in the bible tunics or, or robes long flowing garment uh, not a garment split up the middle but these servants of david were wearing their tunics and they cut their tunics off up above their buttocks section where they could see their buttocks so whether they were wearing some type of undergarment or were not they were exposed and they were embarrassed and what's equated to that here in verse four is the shaving off of half of their beard now that could have been that could have been grabbing it right here and chopping it off or it could have actually been these men were held down and as it, it was a disgraceful thing and they actually shaved off half of their beard to where it was marred it was disfigured well look what king david says here uh, in verse five messengers told david what had happened so he summoned them for the men were thoroughly humiliated and the king said listen what the king says stay in jericho until your beards have grown again and then you may come back <laughs> so <laughs> king david says you stay here until your beards grow back now obviously with a garment cut off they could they could change their garment and put a tunic on right away but to grow back their beard that half of their beard that was shaved that would have taken some time and so he says basically i don't want you coming back you're humiliated you stay until your beards grow back so there is so many verses like this let me pull up another one it's psalm 133 i think it is yes look how good and how pleasant it is when brothers truly live in unity that's verse one. It is like fine oil poured on the head, which flows down the beard, Aaron's beard. Remember, Aaron is the high priest in Israel back at the time of uh, prophet Moshe and then flows down his garments It is like the dew of Hermon, which flows down upon the hills of Zion. Indeed, that is where Yahweh, the Lord in all capital letters, has decreed a blessing will be available eternal life. So this is talking about unity, pleasantry, brotherhood, fine oil, anointed with oil. And it's flowing down the high priest's beard and it flows down to his to his garments. So the high priest here, the holy man in Israel, he had a beard when he ministered before Yahweh. Yeah, the scriptures are just full uh, of, of statements like this uh, about the beard. So there is no commandment saying do not have a beard. So I hope this man's not going to add a commandment. Deuteronomy 4 verse 2, you shall not add to the commandments or take away from the commandments. So I hope he's not going to add a commandment here. It's completely ambiguous, especially in the New Testament. Doesn't even mention it. It doesn't have to. Oh, man. It, something does not have to be reiterated in the New Testament in order for it to be valid or binding. I've taught on this when I teach the Torah and the shocker example would be bestiality. The law against bestiality that's mentioned, I want to say, four separate times in the Torah is not repeated in the New Testament. I was in a debate one time and a guy said, well, I, I know that you're not supposed to lay down and have intercourse with, with animals. And so, you know, that goes without saying. Well, it was said four times in the Torah, and that was because it was a practice of some of the surrounding pagan nations. And believe it or not, I want to say uh, now they, they term it... Uh, zoophilia i think is 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 it's called and it, it's accepted by some people in society today and i want to say it's either seven or 17 percent of americans uh participate in what they call zoophilia or what we call bestiality so it's commanded against four times in the older testament it's not repeated in the newer testament now the common refrain or rebuttal is well it falls under the category of fornication or adultery but when somebody does that and starts categorizing things, then I can fit any of the laws of Yahweh under a category in the New Testament. See, so it kind of backfires on them there. The fact of the matter is, 
It's not specifically mentioned in the Newer Testament. It doesn't have to be. There is a text, though, in the book of Revelation. Here in the book of Revelation, there's a wider context to this, but look at what it says about these locusts in 9 7. It says, Now the locusts looked like horses equipped for battle. On their heads were something like crowns similar to gold, and their faces looked like men's faces. What do you think that is? They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. So they had teeth like lions, crowns similar to gold. They looked like horses equipped for battle, and their faces looked like the face of a male, hair of a female. Hair of a female would be the longest hair. Face of a man, the only way that you can distinguish a male face from a female face is because hair grows on a man's face doesn't grow on a woman's face unless it's, it's the extreme exception to the rule. I understand some women have uh, situations where they have hormonal imbalances and uh, but that's, that's out of the ordinary, right? A man's face here in the book of revelation is a bearded face. I would present to you. And so in Jewish culture, it's totally, it's totally historical. Yeah, Jesus that, was a that Jew. They did have beards. Yeah. And so the first argument I want to make to you from a historical perspective is the conclusion that I have have come to. Um I believe Jesus Christ. I, I believe it 100 percent Jesus Christ did not have a beard. <sighs> and that he had short cropped hair. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you believe it looked and, like a and I'm awesome. gonna take <laughs> some time to show that to you if you'll if you'll go on this journey with me. Now I, I never he just said, Oh my goodness, he was just talking about Israeli culture and Jewish culture. Yeshua was not an American. He was not UPC. He was not Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist. He was a Torah observant Jew. He was a Jewish rabbi of the first century. Of course he had a beard. Of course he had a beard. I don't know what kind of history he's going to say to thwart Jewish culture. It, 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 it's wild, man. Some, some of the things these people say, it blows my mind. I never saw that before. This is a new thing for me to see. Um, but history strongly points us to the conclusion that Jesus did not have a beard. And I want to give those historical arguments to you. So again, in, in early Catholic church history, um, every picture you see is Jesus with long hair and a beard. And typically he's either in regal robes, um, sitting on a throne, you know, the kind of the halo around his head, but the beard and the long hair, um, or he's naked portrayed naked with the long hair and a beard. And um, this is something that is all throughout history. Now, it's important to know that in the Roman Empire, before Christianity, at least their form of Roman Catholicism, Christianity took mm -hmm. over, that there was a, a Roman paganism that was the absolute uh, religion of Europe. The Romans were pagans. They had multiple gods. They had um, gods for many different things. If you wanted, um, if you wanted uh, good fortune, you would pray and offer sacrifice to Fortuna. If you wanted victory in, in a war, you would pray to the goddess Nike. And, and get the favor and the protection of the goddess Nike. Mm. And you would receive the blessing Not of that sure goddess. And so right now. you have Zeus, the king of the gods, the father of all the gods. He's the head god. He is the, he is the highest god in the pantheon of all Roman gods, which of course came from the Greeks and, and so on and so forth, incorporated from the Egyptians and the Babylonians. All these things have overlapping themes throughout history. But Zeus was the, the father. And the image of Zeus is interesting. I want you to look with me here. Oh, boy. The image of Zeus. 
<laughs> is uh, on the left hand side you see Zeus. He's got long hair and a beard. Where they got the Jesus, and he's naked, and he's got this robe sort of draped over him. Jewish culture, very immodest individual. But he doesn't care because he's a god. So, um, but he's he's very regal. He's very in charge. He's very seated on the throne of authority, scepter of authority. And so that was the that was the in the consciousness of Europe that that image. You could go see that image. You could make a pilgrimage to that image. Let me say this right here. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many statues of pagan deities that he brings up right here. It, it, it doesn't matter. It's it's irrelevant. It's totally irrelevant. What does the Hebrew Bible teach? He he just admitted it would be very common. We went over the scriptures, David's men, 2 Samuel 10, Psalm 133, Leviticus 19, 27, and I could take you too many more. I could show you one. Look at this in Isaiah. Now, this could be talking about uh, the prophet Isaiah. It could be depicting the nation of Israel as a whole um, in a masculine form, or it could be messianic to uh, Yeshua the Messiah. Regardless, though, look at what it said about the servant of Yahweh. Um in verse, uh, we'll start at verse four right here. The sovereign Yahweh has given me the capacity to be his spokesman so that I know how to help the weary. He wakes me up every morning. He makes me alert so I can listen attentively as disciples do. The sovereign Yahweh has spoken to me clearly. I have not rebelled. I have not turned back. Look at this. I offered my back to those who attacked. My jaws to those who tore out my beard. I did not hide my face from insults and spitting but the sovereign yahweh helps me so i'm not humiliated for that reason i'm steadfastly resolved i know i will not be put to shame verse six is key i offered my back to those who attacked which reminds us of the gospels uh, where yeshua is tortured and then my jaws or i think the king james says my cheeks to those who plucked out the hair my jaws to those who tore out my beard I did not hide my face from what insults and spitting. It was an insult to tear out the beard of this Hebrew man, whether it's the prophet Isaiah, the nation of Israel, or it's messianic to, to Yeshua. So Isaiah 50 and 6, Psalm 133 with Aaron's beard, unity, brotherhood, precious oil. Leviticus 19 in the actual Torah um, about not rounding the sides of the hair. Uh, keeping the payout and not marring the borders or the sides of the beard. And then Second Samuel 10, David's men were greatly ashamed. David said, you stay there till your beards grow back. So it doesn't matter, brothers and sisters. It doesn't matter that he brings up this statue. It doesn't matter. We don't base what we believe off of depictions or statues of Zeus. Uh, can Zeus have something correct? Can the statue of Zeus have something correct? Yeah, yeah. Any denomination of Christianity can have something correct in what they believe. You know, I could meet a rank heathen out here on the street and he has peyote and a beard and he may not believe in the creator and may claim that, that he's agnostic or, or atheist. That doesn't mean that I can't have a beard or shouldn't have a beard or peyote because my heathen neighbor does. What does the scripture say? What does the Torah say? That's the thing. See, and um, it's interesting. It just came to my mind. I hope I'm getting the right right church here. But if, if I'm not mistaken, in the Book of Revelation, it talks about the the Church of Pergamos, which is where the seat of Satan is. There was actually a temple, the temple to Zeus, mm. in Pergamos. And again, I. I'm almost positive that's the one, but one of those churches, Paul uh, or John, the Apostle John said that where the seat of Satan is, and that particular city, which I believe to be Pergamos, was actually the temple to Zeus. That's just an interesting correlation. But so this this image, everybody knew about Zeus in Europe. It was common. This is the king of the gods. He's the father of all the gods. He's the head god. And then you had a different version of Zeus. This was a Zeus that was relatable. This was a Zeus that was common, commoner and commoner robes. On the right-hand side, you see what was called Zeus Serapis. 
And Zeus Serapis, he, he's wearing robes. He's kind of scraggly, long hair and a beard. Uh, interestingly enough, if I had no on the bat, words on here, right. you might mistake Wild this man. for an ancient statue of Jesus Christ because it looks like him. Or Aaron or David's mean. And so what happened? Emperor Constantine instituted the Catholic Church the to of Isaiah 50. bring about a marriage for the sake of influence and unity. He's thinking, how can I influence as many people as I can? How can we bring together as many people as we possibly can? So he married ancient Roman paganism with this new world religion that's taken over called Christianity. Uh, the Catholic Church is a marriage. He's calling the beard pagan here, folks. This is what he's doing. So he's indicting all of these Hebrew scriptures that we just went through. It, it's wild. This is wild. It's unbelievable. Between Roman paganism and Christianity. And so what do they do? Yes, he thinks all the Christian men were clean shaven. They created this image of Jesus Christ that would match the image that was in the consciousness of the Roman world, which was the world, that would match the consciousness of the culture. And they made this image of wow. Jesus Christ wow. in these wow. regal robes sitting on his throne. And they also had a common Jesus with long hair. Both are long hair and a beard. And you can look, uh, I believe this painting was out of, uh, out of um, the Egyptians actually created this sort of persona of Zeus Serapis, the common Zeus Serapis. When you look at the image on the left, that's the common Zeus Serapis. The image on the right is Jesus Christ. Allegedly, <laughs> with long hair and a beard. And so you can see that there was a matching mm. going on. They wanted to they wanted to be able, it would be less difficult for these pagans to accept a Jesus Christ. What is sad here? Oh, brothers and sisters. It's it's hard for me to hold my tongue, but I, I want to make it through this, and we're only 17 minutes in. Man, it's going to be long. <laughs> But it, it is what's sad here is that people who are in his amen corner in his branch of Pentecostalism, they will dismiss everything that he said shortly about Hebrew scripture, Leviticus and Jewish culture. And they'll go with this. And I mean, he's calling he, he he's calling me a pagan for having locks. Let's see. And having a beard. Wild, man. Wild. Who looked like their old religion. It would be less of an obstacle to them. It would be less of a, a hurdle they would have to, uh, to get over. Because this Jesus looks like the son of Zeus. He's the son of the God. The son of the father of the gods. And he looks like a manifestation. Zeus Serapis was a manifestation of a common Zeus, a relatable Zeus. This Jesus Christ looks like him. So is Jesus not the son of God? See, if we're going to say, well, because this statue looks somewhat similar to how this depiction of Jesus looks, the depiction can't be correct. Well, then can Jesus not be the son of God? Because what if... Satan in his craftiness and knowledge and wisdom, and he's thousands and thousands and thousands of years old, tries to mimic at times things that Yahweh has done, is doing, or will do. I get into this a lot with a virgin conception. When you look at the virgin births or the virgin conceptions in paganism, pagan religions, none of them quite are equal to what takes place in Matthew 1 and Luke 1. They're similar, but it's almost like Satan is trying to mimic what he knows Yahweh is going to do, but he can't mimic it exactly. And so he's got these gods or demigods coming down out of heaven and mating with a human woman and producing a demigod offspring. 
but he can't quite do the miracle. Satan is a master deceiver. Uh, so it, it, by, his, by his own reasoning, then Jesus couldn't be the son of God because it's, it's a crossover from paganism. It doesn't make sense, folks. So this was an intentional blending of the concept of Jesus Christ and the concept of Zeus and Zeus Serapis. Mm. And so Unbelievable. it's interesting because the Catholic church, you know, they not only, um, they not only took these images of Jesus and, and, um, uh, made this but they also substituted there's there are a lot of people that were wanting more gods than just one god and three persons hmm. they, they needed more than that what about if we if we want victory who do we pray to if we want victory and they said well we'll even we'll even have that for you as well what if what if we want financial blessing there's a saint you can pray to for for financial blessing now instead of it being a god called fortuna it's a saint called matthew Pray to St. Matthew and you'll have financial blessing. Mm -hmm. Instead of it, if you want a, a victory in war, instead of praying to the goddess Nike, you pray to St. Michael. And so everything was merged. Everything was replaced with sort of a Christian themed, a Christian taste version of paganism. That way, these people coming out of paganism would be able to merge right into this new Christianity that truly was paganism with another face, paganism with another flavor. You're saying a lot here that, that included Christianity. So now he's got the Christians and the pagans, and they're all together. In hand with and we have this unified so empire of Rome. <laughs> it's a brilliant move. A brilliant move. And so, <clears throat> looking at history. Looking at history, it's interesting. Now, the Bible is history, inspired history. We also, so these images that you're seeing of Jesus Christ, these are, these are much later images. And unfortunately, we had nobody with a camera um, to take pictures of Jesus Christ. And uh, we have the Hebrew that way we Bible can know emphatically, Jesus did not have long hair and a beard. But, but, the validity of it, of historical data, is based upon many factors, two of which are very powerful factors. Number one is the, the distance in time from the data to the actual historical event it's depicting. The distance in time from the historical data to the actual historical event it's, de event it's depicting. And number two, if there's a multiplicity of unrelated sources, that is a priceless treasure for mm -hmm. a historian. Because these two people didn't talk at all, and they're coming up with the same conclusions about this event. So if we were to say, did Jesus have long hair and a beard? Well, let's, are there any depictions of Jesus Christ? Yes, there are thousands of depictions of Jesus Christ. Okay. Well, what? are the earliest depictions of Jesus Christ. All right, before he gets into this, let me say that there have been people throughout history that depicted Jesus, Yeshua, in a certain way because that way felt more comfortable or at home or akin to them. It doesn't matter if we find a white Jesus painted, a black Jesus painted, a Hispanic Jesus painted. It doesn't matter if we find a Jesus that's clean shaven, a Jesus with a mustache or a Jesus with a short beard or a Jesus with a long beard in a painting by a painter or an artist or a depictor. Hebrew scripture is what matters. <laughs> so people oftentimes, even today, you know, this might be a, a, a crude uh, example, but um, uh, black parents of little black children will present Santa Claus as being black. White parents of little white children will present Santa Claus as being white. It's whatever is familiar to a person that makes them feel more comfortable. And so if you find early Christian art that depicted Yeshua, 
clean shaven, it very well could have been that there was a pulling away of uh, by the Gentile Christian population from uh, uh, Second Temple period Judaism, and they wanted to get further and further away from anything Jewish or Hebrew. And so that could have been why they depicted Yeshua as being clean shaven. Uh, they never saw him, but we don't want to have anything to do with with uh, uh, being Jewish. And so therefore, you know, therefore, we're, we're not going to keep Passover on the 14th day of, of Aviv or Nisan. We're going to celebrate Easter uh, the Sunday after the full moon, after the vernal equinox. And um, we're going to teach a three person God. <laughs> which I, I mean, I'm not one this, but I agree with this, this guy that the Trinity is a later Gentile Christian development. Um, uh, we're not going to keep the Sabbath. We're not going to keep the feast. It's too Jewish. We don't want to look Jewish. We want to do things different. And so that, that, that would account for depictions that showed him, showed Yeshua uh, being smooth faced, um, which is probably what he's about to get to here. What do they say about the subject? And a Astoundingly, they say something very different than what popular culture says, than what the most popular pictures say. What about the Hebrew Bible? Not only do they say something different, they're earlier. They're earlier. So is the Hebrew Bible. It's earlier. And so earliest. when you look at the earliest depictions of Jesus Christ, there is a common ground between them. Number one, he had short cropped hair. Number two, he was clean shaven. Now forget the Bible, forget, forget. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, religious preference, forget. Forget the Bible. Bro, forget the Bible. <laughs> what, what the heck? <laughs> no, no, you can't forget the scriptures, man. Come on. Um, denominations, forget, forget it all. Yeah, we, Just we, from a completely historical perspective, from historical analysis, the earliest depictions of Jesus Christ that were closest to the man Christ Jesus, the time frame that he lived on earth, Jesus was clean shaven and had short cropped hair. Off the ears, off the neck. You look at these pictures. St. Callisto Catacomb in Rome. This is third century. Third century. So when you say third century, you're talking about the 200s. When you say yeah. second century, you're talking about the 100s. Sure. Uh, whenever you say a century, you're talking about the, the numbers that led up about to that. So if you're fifth century, Judea, it's 400s. Brother. If it's... 19th century, it's it's 1800s. We're in the 21st century, and yet we're in the 2000s, right? It's 2024, but we're in the 21st century. So when this says third century, this was found and dated in the 200s, which shows about 200 years after the life of Jesus Christ. All the way to the right, again, third century. This is in Syria. Third century, Jesus uh, raising up a... Um, of the lame man. This was a depiction of Jesus Christ raising up the lame man from his bed. And you see Jesus standing there, short hair, clean shaven, and the man is carrying his bed right here. And then the absolute oldest depiction, exactly 200 years, roughly, exactly roughly, 200 years from the ascension of Jesus Christ out of this world was found in an old abandoned church in Syria called Dura Europos. That's the one in the middle, I'm guessing, yeah. This is literally the oldest church in history that's ever been found in text. That's the one with the issue. Where they worship the, Jesus Christ. Like they depicted the Zizi And actor. on the walls of this church, you, you should look this up. This is not Joe Campatella. This is... This is um, his story. On the walls of the Dira Europos, this was uh, near the Euphrates River, actually. They found a depiction of Jesus' life. Jesus as a baby, Jesus as a young boy, Jesus as a 
as a young man, Jesus in his ministry, and here Jesus is healing the woman with the issue of blood. In every single instance where Jesus is depicted in this church, he's got short hair and he's clean shaven. <laughs> oh my goodness. That is astounding to me. And so it's astounding to me that you would take later Gentile Christian depictions of Jesus over the Hebrew Bible. That's what's astounding to me, Brother Joe. That blows my mind. <laughs> so, so what happened? Now, this is all third century, right? What happened? When, when did the images of Jesus change? And this is probably the most astounding part. Here we go. Hmm. It changed in the fourth century. What happened in the fourth century? What, 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 what famous events happened in the fourth century that changed everything about the Christian world? Well, Council of Nicaea, 325 AD, where the mode of baptism was changed. And you can read this in the Catholic encyclopedias. They admit this. <clears throat> the mode of baptism was changed from repeating Matthew 28, 19. I'm sorry, from obeying Matthew 28, 19, which is using the name of Jesus Christ to repeating or reciting Matthew 28, 19, because they needed three persons. I'm going to let him go. On what that. else changed? I don't want The doctrine of the Trinity up on a was rabbit trail. solidified. Uh, no. The Catholic Church became its most, right, I, in the state that it's in now, the fourth century solidified that. Okay, I've got to make it's a comment about the Council of Nicaea. Everybody blames the Council of Nicaea for everything. So two major things were decided. The date for Easter, which uh, was the Christian way of not being too Jewish on, on the Passover. That's all I'll say about that. And the nature of Jesus was at the Council of Nicaea. Not the, not the established doctrine of the Trinity. That didn't come later till. I think it's the Council of Constantinople in 381 and the Council of Chalcedon in 451 solidified the dual nature, at least in the minds of the majority of, of churchmen, Christian churchmen. But the Council of Nicaea had to do with, is Jesus of similar nature or the same nature as the Father? Um, and not all bishops that were there agreed. I think there were two dissenting ones. Um, and then later on, uh, there was still a battle with what's called Arianism, um, uh, the, the doctrine that's pretty much purported by the modern day Jehovah's Witnesses. So I'm not sure about the mode of baptism. Um, I don't think that that was talked about at the Council of Nicaea. I, I could be wrong on that, but um, him being one that's Pentecostal, obviously he's going to, he's going to say that that's when it was changed. So, and not only did they solidify that doctrine, they solidified a new Look, look with me at this. This is the standardized image of Jesus Christ after the fourth century. Hmm. Hmm. Long hair and a beard. Now, forget Bible, forget spirit, forget uh. cultural, forget all that. From a historian's perspective, which of these are more valid? The ones that are closer to the events described the life of Jesus or the ones that are further away? Well, it's the ones that are closer. Do we have a multiplicity oh, of sources? Goodness. Yes. So from a historical perspective only, Jesus Christ was clean shaven and he had short hair. From a Gentile Christian historical perspective in third century 200s based upon their drawings. That's what he's saying. Forget the Bible. Forget everything else. We just want to go based on Gentile Christian history. And he talks about getting further back to the source. Mind blown. Mind blown that a man would take this over the Hebrew Bible. Mind blown. Unbelievable. 
Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's what I say. That is <laughs> that is astounding to me. Oh, man. absolutely astounding to me. Bless him, Father. And so, <clears throat> now, now, of course, this would have been counterculture. If you look at, at Jewish or Roman coinage uh, uh, around AD 70, I know, I know the secular world uses um, CE and BCE. It just makes me mad because they want to take Jesus out of the picture. So in defiance of that, I always use BC and AD before Christ and Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. So whether they like it or not, everything changed when Jesus was born. All date systems changed. Everything changed. So forgive me if I'm offending the scholars that are listening by using the old-fashioned terms of BC and AD. But 70 AD, Roman Emperor Titus destroys Rome. They had they made coinage of putting down the Jewish revolt. And and in that coinage, Jewish men all had short hair. These were not Jewish coins. These were Roman coins showing Jews that were subjugated. They all had short hair. And the truth is, is most of the culture of that day, you know, is Greek culture. Mm -hmm. Greek culture was like the epitome of culture. Even the Romans adored Greek culture. They conquered them, but they adored them. And the Greeks were like these high, lofty philosophers that just knew more than anybody. And even though the Romans conquered them, they still secretly adored them and thought they were the purest form of their culture. And the Greek look for a young man in that day was scraggly beard. Not, not long Jewish, but just scraggly. Notice, not long Jewish beard. Aaron, David's men. Oh, Yeshua. <laughs> not even a go goatee like the pictures of Jesus show, but just kind of scraggly, just not clean shaven, just unkept beard, just, you know, fluffy, fuzzy. That was Greek culture. So for Jesus, and, and, and you know, it's Greek culture. I mean, the New Testament is written in Greek. It was, a, it was a Greek colony conquered by Alexander the Great, Palestine. And so, so Jesus, and of course the hair too was kind of unkept. It would be long and scraggly. It wouldn't be like woman long, but it would be beyond the natural boundaries, kind of shoulder length, kind of the picture you see of Jesus Christ in every movie that you've seen. That would be the Greek version. And, and for Jesus to have short hair and be clean shaven would have been counterculture to the sinfulness of the pop culture of his day. Oh. He would have been an outlier to have cut hair and be clean shaven. Oh, my Lord. My Lord. This stuff lights me on fire. Mm. I, I love Jesus. Oh, boy. I love Jesus. And so... <clears throat> Makes me sad. You have this historical, powerful historical data no. that we see. And, and that, is the, that is the historical argument that when the Catholic Church changed and solidified their paganism paradigm over Christianity, they also solidified this new image of Jesus Christ that would fit their old paganism and bring everybody together so let's just bring everybody together in unity. But in the process, identity was lost. True identity was lost. So now, what about the scriptural argument? So we have the historical argument. What about the scriptural argument? There's only one scripture, and I want you to look at this with me. Isaiah chapter 50. Uh, probably the one I went and through. verse six. So this is a messianic prophecy. Most people do agree that this is a messianic prophecy. This is the only scripture in the Bible. Now we're leaving the historical argument. We're going to put it all together at the end, but this is the only scripture in the Bible for the Jesus had a beard concept. I gave my back. I'm reading from the King James Version. I gave my back to the smiters. Okay, that's in the New Testament. We see that played out. And my cheeks 
to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Now, the first thing that stands out to me about this scripture is that the Hebrew language, in the Hebrew language, it's not short on a word for beard. And yet the word for beard was not used in Isaiah in 50, 50 and 6. Oh, my goodness. So because the word beard is not used. So if I said in English, I gave my cheeks to somebody who plucked off the hair and did not hide my face from shame. If I said that in English, you wouldn't know I was talking about a beard. Oh, man. The links that people will go to get around what the Bible teaches. Unbelievable. The Hebrew word for beard is zakan, which is the beard, the chin. It means an this, elder. This stuff right here. In Hebrew, it means an elder, well, a bearded one. And like myself. <laughs> and so the word that was used in this verse was lahi, which means jaw or cheek. The, the jaw, translated it, jaw begins, I'm, I'm moving my jaw right now, right? There's a bone right here. It's kind of like mid-ear, where my sideburns are, actually. And my jaw goes from there all the way down, okay? And then, but the, then the Hebrew actually dif differentiates between the jaw, right here, and the chin. This is wild, man. He's trying to say The word that was beard. used here <laughs> is jaw. Oh, my goodness. Now, <clears throat> Unbelievable. You, you, I know you've probably heard this story, but um, the, the Old Testament is written from, uh, translated from the Masoretic text. The King James um, scholars had this text that they used, based on which version and, and all that. And um, thankfully, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in Qumran um, by a young boy who... who I believe the story goes, he just mm -hmm. kind of wandered into a cave. He heard some, throwing rocks, heard something break, and he found these old vases with these scrolls. And it turns out they were a thousand years older than our Masoretic texts. And they powerfully confirmed the validity of the Masoretic text. It's, it's one of the greatest confirmations that the Bible we, we read is it's accurate. But there was one particular scripture that when compared to the Dead Sea Scrolls presented an enormous challenge to the translators. Guess what scripture it was? Isaiah 50 and 6. It presented such a translation challenge that they this literally heard this called this scripture. I'm looking for the, uh, oh, here we go. Cruxus interpretum. I don't know Latin. I just read that. Cruxus interpretum. This, this means a passage that is extremely that, difficult uh, or even impossible to understand. Here. What's so hard to understand about it? Isaiah 50 and 6 is, is a cruxus interpretum. Extremely difficult to translate and ex almost impossible to fully understand what's being said. And surprisingly enough, the Dead Sea Scrolls didn't mention the Hebrew word for beard either. Now that's that is astounding to me. And then Jaws if you take nine. it now, now if you look Any in the New Jaws Testament, nine. there are many, many, many prophecies are plainly fulfilled in the New Testament. Read Isaiah 53. I mean, I mean, just on and on. There's so many, so many prophecies, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of prophecies fulfilled by the life of Jesus Christ. You want to know one of the prophecies that's not reiterated in the New Testament? No apostle. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul. 
None of the gospels, none of the epistles ever, ever confirm that the beard of Jesus Christ was plucked. That's weird. That's pretty weird. Doesn't matter if Isaiah 50 and 6 doesn't talk about the beard. Right now, I still think that it does. Um, I would think the NET would have a footnote on this if there was some discrepancy. But uh, he mentioned the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's something I'll have to look into at a later time. But even if Isaiah 50 and 6, as I mentioned before he ever brought it up, is not talking about the Messiah, the Messiah was still Hebrew, was still Jewish. He would have abode by Leviticus 19, 27. And then if you were to look at the Septuagint, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, and, and it contains many diversions and there's many different things. But, but the Septuagint renders Isaiah 50 and 6. I gave my cheeks, which is the jawbone that King James Version is talking about, to blows. Mm -hmm. I gave my jawbone to blows. Right, slap. Now, what's the Septuagint? What's, what's all that about? Do we even look at the Septuagint? I want you to know something. The Septuagint was routinely quoted from by the New Testament writers. Woo! That's why when you look at the New well, Testament look, quoting of an Old look. Testament verse, it can look very different. The meaning is caught, but it can look very, very different. Extremely different. This is from Oxford University Press. I, this may be my favorite episode. I love all this historical stuff. I'm geeking out right now. I'm just totally geeking out. Oxford University Press. Hellenistic Jewish literature. And you can show this, Brother Alex, if you want. Hellenistic Jewish literature formed the ideological framework for the New Testament authors, as noted in the previous chapter. Almost all of the direct citations, however, come from the scriptures that were later canonized in the Hebrew Bible. Many studies on the New Testament author's use of the Jewish scriptures have demonstrated conclusively that the writers most often, if not always, use the Septuagint instead of the Hebrew scriptures. <laughs> Sweet molasses. No wonder there's no confirmation of the beard of Jesus being plucked in the New Testament. No wonder. I wonder if he would accept other Septuagintal readings. I'm very familiar with the Septuagint. Um, I even lean towards Septuagintal primacy. I think there's an eclectic text of the Older Testament that where we examine the Masoretic text, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Septuagint, the Samaritan Pentateuch, and to see which reading is best in each instance where there's differences or corruptions. But I wonder if he would accept the Septuagint in, in other readings that maybe went against <laughs> something that he believed denominationally. So um, let's continue on. And it says Jesus gave his cheeks. Could it be? Because we have them smiting Jesus. Could it be? That as his cheeks were receiving the blows from those soldiers and from the Sanhedrin, they grabbed that some of that sideburn on his on the on the jawbone and just ripped. Because there's no reference to that prophecy being fulfilled in New Testament. There's a complete omission of the beard of Jesus being plucked in the New Testament. And of course, this would align with the terminology of the KJV. Now you look at newer translations, they all put beard. They just infer, it's the beard. It's the beard. It's the beard. There's a beard right there, obviously. Mm. Uh, that's not a direct translation. That's a paraphrase. And that's, a, uh, that's what you want to see because it aligns with the chosen. <laughs> right? It aligns with Jesus of Nazareth. It's a great movie. It aligns with... The passion of the Christ, beard, Greek beard, and long hair. Lines with the Hebrew Bible. Of course they plucked his beard. My God, haven't you seen the movie? Well, you're going to be hard-pressed. You're going to be hard-pressed scripturally. 
So you have the historical. Before he continues on, I want to show you an alternate reading of a text in Deuteronomy. So he's shown an alternate rendition of Isaiah 50 and 6. Um, I'm intrigued by the Septuagint. I have no problem if Isaiah 15, 6 is talking about blows. I'm not even persuaded that Isaiah 15, 6 is a reference specifically to Yeshua, as I mentioned previously. But if he's right on his reading there, it doesn't do away with anything that the Hebrew scriptures say about the beard in general. I have to do more study on that. Let's look at a alternate reading of a text in Deuteronomy. This is from Targum, the Aramaic Targum Pseudo-Jonathan in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5, where commonly a man shall not wear that which pertaineth to a woman, neither shall a woman wear that which pertaineth to a man, or neither shall a woman put on a man's garment. Look at this right here. Neither fringed robes nor tefillin, which are the ornaments of a man, shall be upon a woman. Neither shall a man shave himself so as to appear like a woman. For everyone who doeth so is an abomination before the Lord thy God. So here's an alternate rendering of another scripture that is not going to go in his favor. I don't think he's going to like this one. But this alternate rendering says that a man shouldn't shave his face. This is an Aramaic targum. Aramaic is basically uh, a translation or a paraphrase of uh, Hebrew scripture. When Ezra, uh, in I think it's Ezra chapter 8, or right around that section in the book of Ezra, he would read the scriptures in Hebrew, and then he would uh, give the sense. Probably he would translate them into Aramaic for the people. So here's an alternate reading of a text that is popular in Pentecostal churches that uh, I don't think he's going to present in any sermon anytime soon. <laughs> All right, let's go back to his... Uh, study here context in which the data historical data closest to the actual life of jesus christ from a time frame perspective all show jesus christ multiplicity of sources different times different locations short hair no beard clean shaven and you have this one single scripture in the old testament no that's, That's about as scripture. unclear as it gets, not verified in the New Testament, which the actual translations the apostles quoted from says nothing about a beard being plucked, but that his cheeks were given to blows. Yeah, decent point there. Woo! Doesn't mean he didn't there's have There's kind of a case being built right no, here. No, there's no case. I there's word. No case. I word. That doesn't prove he didn't have a beard. So that's the historical argument. <laughs> and the scriptural argument. And now there's another argument. There's a spiritual argument. Oh boy, here we go. I want to tell you something. We, we are in the middle of a covert cultural revolution right now in our society. We are undergoing one of the most dramatic cultural revolutions in the history of America right now. The 1960s were a cultural revolution. So get rid of your beard. 1920s, man. the Roaring Twenties were a cultural revolution. <laughs> um, women started wearing pants and cutting their hair in the 20s, and especially it was really solidified in the the 30s and 40s, when they went to the factories Protestant to produce for the absence of men that were at the war, they, they went there, they cut their hair, they wore they wore pants. That was not in that was not in culture for the first 1900 years of of human history after Christ. Definitely not in culture in ancient history. So a, a cultural revolution occurred in 1900s, 1920, 19. 40s, 1960s, and in the 1960s in particular, beards came back and scraggly hair. Man, they came back. They made a comeback. All these hippies out there with the free love people, 
they they had their beards and their long hair and and they were of course they had their diseases too oh my gosh. Sharon oh my gosh so the argument he's going to make now is going to have to do with we shouldn't look like the cultural revolution of the 50s and the 60s maybe 60s i guess 60s and 70s the hippie revolution that's what he's going to say they had their diseases too let's throw that out there <laughs> so it, it basically he's going to say we we shouldn't look like the world um, yeah just i'm starting to get a little tired here uh, but we want to finish this out and needles and all kinds of sharing wives sharing girlfriends they were sharing everything and it was the the rebels of the 60s cultural revolution i want to tell you something we are on at this very moment in time make no mistake about it we are undergoing now that was an overt cultural revolution right that was in the streets we are going undergoing a covert cultural revolution things are happening behind the scenes in plain sight but behind the scenes changes are being made right now that are astounding and that are dramatically unalterably changing the trajectory of our nation transgenderism that you know started happening nine minutes ago is preached as if it's always been the case and you're gonna link the beard up with this homosexuality and now even pedophilia is being pushed. Listen, this stuff's being pushed like it's always been the case. And if you listen, oh my goodness, the scriptures are directly against these abominable practices. The same scriptures that teach against homosexual practice, men trying to be women, women trying to be men, Deuteronomy 22 and 5. Those same scriptures teach that the men of Israel had beards. Leviticus 19, 2 Samuel 10, Psalm 133. If we're going to preach that the scriptures are true and it speaks against homosexual practice or bestiality or transgenderism, why are we not going to preach that the scriptures are true when it speaks about or against a man having a clean shaving face, a man of Israel having a clean shaven face? You do not agree with it. You are a wacko and you deserve to be canceled, silenced, shut up, barred from any kind of influence. That is our culture. If you speak anything contrary to the narrative that the masses are walking to, you will be canceled. And we are undergoing a cultural revolution in our government, a political revolution i think he's just filling up space our here government this, but. i mean you just look at covid folks this is it is it's not over it is not over and what is all this doing is to bring about the final season the final chapter of time and humanity on planet earth church is about to leave antichrist is about to appear all that stuff you can look at previous episodes for that. The point I'm making, no comment, <laughs> is that we are beyond any shadow now. of a doubt also going through a cultural revolution in our movement right now as we speak. It is happening so fast. It is happening and it's building such a momentum and it seems unalterable and it's the mirror image of what's been happening in our nation. It's the mirror image. If you speak a word against it, you're going to get shut down. You're going to get nailed. You're going to get canceled. You're going to get blacklisted. You're going to get demonized. Can I tell you for something? Can I tell you something? Old-fashioned apostolic Pentecostalism. Oh, 
is where it's at. Early 1900s? Is that what you're calling it? It is fashion? where it's at. That's where the power. I grew up in this. I, I remember. Oh, my goodness. I don't want to be mean. I don't want to sound mean. Um, old fashioned is not the 1950s or the early 1900s, brothers and sisters. That's not old fashioned. The old paths, the prophet Jeremiah, I think chapter six, he talks about seeking the old paths. Wherein is the good way? Walk in them. You'll find rest for your souls. So the old paths have to be prior to the prophet Yahu. The old paths is the law of Moshe, the Torah of Yahweh, uh, or the way that the patriarchs walked before Elohim, Noah, Enoch, Abraham. The, 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 this is the old timey ways, not the not the not the old fashioned Pentecostal ways. And if we're going to just look at the culture and do the opposite of them, if you go away from the hippie culture in the 60s and 70s and go back to the 40s and 50s, the men were all clean shaven with short haircuts. They weren't religious. <laughs> Are we to do the opposite of them? We don't look at what the world's doing and just do the opposite. We go by what Yahweh says in his instruction manual in the Torah. That's what we base things on, not the culture. Oh, my Lord Jesus. Separation from the culture was so profoundly preached. Not only behind closed doors and local churches with no live stream. I'm going to stop this at two hours. So we're going to. It was speak. preached in public at the largest venues that were available. And now, because we are in the midst of the seduction of this church cultural revolution, and it's it's only been happening for nine minutes. And everybody acts as if this is the way it's always been. And if you don't believe this, you're a complete wacko. <clears throat> but now that we are in the seduction of this revolution, the voices that birthed this movement would not be welcome in our current pulpits. No way on God's green earth. For instance... And this is why I get in trouble because I'm just going to say stuff. And um, I'm having a great life. I'm not mad at anybody. We're going to eat a great meal after this. I'm having the time of my life. I really am. I've dealt with cancellation. I've dealt with opposition. I've but man, I, I want to tell you, I've never felt closer to the Lord. I, I've got people that have my back. Whew. I'm I'm good. I'm having a good time right now. While he's on his Mac computer with a state-of-the-art microphone, and excellent video quality and a studio and, and all of that. Is that worldly? Are you trying to compete with the culture? See, they, you know, the Pentecostals dress more fancy than any other church I've ever been to. Um, you'd think they were going to some kind of, you know, highfalutin ball or something. Is that not trying to compete with the culture? No, I really, this is, and this is probably my favorite episode. I don't even, it may get two views, but this is probably my favorite episode. But, but <clears throat> the people that, whew, the people that birthed this movement, the people that laid the foundation, I'm looking at brother Joe and brother Alex right now. I'm just, I'm needing an audience or something. Lord have mercy or an organ in the background. <laughs> they would not be welcome in the pulpits of our largest venues. Would Aaron the high priest be welcome in your pulpit? My Pentecostal brother. What would King David say about you? He told the men that had half of their beard shaved, stay there till your beards be grown. What would he say about you? You're clean shaven on purpose. No foreign king or foreign nation grabbed you, held you down and shaved off your beard. You did it on purpose. Would King David be welcome? Remember when King David, on a run for his life, the whole issue about the showbread and the priest and Saul and all of that, he let Spittle, he acted like a madman, and let Spittle run down his beard to show that he was acting or he wanted to depict himself as being crazy, showing that King David had a beard. Would David be allowed in your pulpit? Or would he be too scraggly, too gnarly or nasty, as you alluded to? For instance... In a urchin, 
at Because of the Times said, don't wear beards because it looks like homosexuality or drug dealers. I don't care what Mr. Urshan said. I only care what Yahweh said in the Torah. I only care what his Hebrew prophet said, what prophet Moshe said. I'm offended that somebody would say, don't wear beards because you look like a homosexual or a drug dealer. I'm going to stop before I say something that's going to get me in trouble. <laughs> oh. What? Yeah, what? What? It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. What? Oh, my goodness. What pulpit's he going to preach in nowadays? Not mine. Not a one. Sure. Not mine. Not a single one. He wouldn't say it in the Jewish synagogue. That you can find that on YouTube, by the way. Not interested. I have a good friend that sent that to me. I won't mention his name for fear that he will be stabbed with spears in his back. Billy Cole. Billy Cole. Woohoo, Billy. William H. Cole. Saw more miracle signs and wonders than, I don't know, any human that ever lived. Possibly, most likely. Guess what he talked about? Staying away from the culture. He said at Louisiana camp meeting, he said this at Louisiana camp meeting, stay away from television. And he said it stronger than that. First he said, stay away from the world's mass media. And then he got real specific. I think God was poking him. He said, he said, we are about, to, this was in, I think, late 80s, 89, if I remember correctly. And you can find this on YouTube. That's the problem with all this. You can actually find it on YouTube. He said, we are about, and this was before the Ethiopian Crusades and Papua New Guinea, before, and he was prophesying, God's going to fill over 3,000 people with the Holy Ghost. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And he took all kinds of flack for that. But he said, as long as we stay away from television, we can sustain this revival. No problem. What here. pulpit would he be welcome in? What's happened? We have changed. We have shifted. And the shift has been so dramatic. The shift has been so dramatic and lethal. And I've got to tell you, we better repent quick. <laughs> All right. We're going to stop it right there um, because I, I don't want to go too far. I said I'd stop at the two hour mark. But before we do, I want to give you some statements from some other men in Christianity. These are statements that I doubt that he would ever share with you. This is from a book that I wrote called Which Side Will You Choose? Let me make sure it's coming up on the screen. All right. I'm going to read. Here from my book, we're going to talk about Clement. This is on page 38, which side will you choose? It reads, you may have heard before of a man named Clement of Alexandria. He often comes up in discussions about the early church fathers. Clement is considered to be such a father, and many of his writings have been kept intact for us to examine and learn from in the century we now live. This quite fascinating. This is quite fascinating, seeing that he wrote during the 2nd century A.D., between 100 and 200 A.D., over 1,800 years ago in his writings, Clement comments on the beard, making statements like, For God wished women to be smooth and rejoice in their locks alone, growing spontaneously as a horse in his mane, but has adorned man like the lions with a beard, and endowed him as an attribute of manhood, a sign this of strength and rule, this then the mark of the man by which he is seen to be a man is older than Eve, and his token is the token of the superior nature. Clement also stated, moving on down, for an ample beard suffices for men, and if one too shave a part of his beard, it must not be made entirely bare, for this is a disgraceful sight. Uh, let's see. Many of the reformers wore beards. Peter Waldo, Heinrich Bullinger, William Farrell, John Calvin, John Wycliffe, all donned beards. William Tyndale, a man whom we owe a great amount of respect, wore a beard. This man was responsible for the first English translation of the scriptures. 
Tyndale was continuously dodging persecution from the Roman Catholic Church in his day, all for the sake of translating the Bible into the language of the common people. Let's move on down. William Tyndale friends wore a beard. 1528, he said, shaving was borrowed from the heathen, and the shaven nation hath put Christ out of his room. Uh, let's see. The great Baptist preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon wore a beard. Uh, let's see, uh, 1859, an Englishman by the name of James Ward wrote a pamphlet entitled A Defense of the Beard. In it, he listed 18 reasons why a man was bound to grow a beard unless he was indifferent as to offending the creator and good taste. Go to ministersnewcovenant.org, visit the article section on my site, scroll down, and you can read my short booklet, 50, 60 pages on the beard. I hope you've enjoyed this. I got kind of wore out towards the end. I get kind of perturbed when I hear somebody talk about the old times or the old paths, old timey Pentecostalism, and they're just talking about the 1900s, the early 1900s, early 20th century. So, but hopefully this was good. Um, maybe I'll do more of them in the future. Sorry for going so long. Maybe some of you are like, Brother Matthew, I'm so glad you went this long this time. <laughs> but may Yahweh richly bless you according to his will. I love you. Shalom.